Please note that this video has spoilers for the subject. Put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast, so while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. The Born Supremacy Movie Thoughts. So obviously, it shows that the movie has got a weighty pair of stones that they kill off Marie really early on. However, it does also really take away something that the movie then lacks in comparison to the first. She just added a sort of a certain human quality. Because without her, all we're left with are CIA and killers. And some CIA killers. And yeah, she just she brought that very sort of everyman quality to it. She she's she's a regular person and she yeah, I don't know. And it's really too bad because in this they actually feel much more like a, an actual couple than at any point in the first one. You know, those 10-15 minutes, I don't know, maybe they saved it up for two years and had just 10-15 minutes in them and then, you know, Green Grabs was like, oh, we're, we're losing it, Kirill, do it now. I'm, I'm pretty sure his name is Kirill, you know, the Carl Urban character. Is it ever actually mentioned in this movie? I, I must have read it off the cast list on IMDb. Anyway, yeah, I, I really, I, I miss her for the most, for most of this movie. And I really feel that it, it, it loses something that the, the first one had that really made that movie work a bit better than this one. You know, th this one ends up being a, a bit too, I don't know, too, maybe humorless is a little, is sort of the word, yeah, so, something like that, and, but, but yes, to, to return to the first thing I said, it does, it, it is a chance to take, to have her, and it's, I'm pretty sure it's not something that you knew at all from like trailers and, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure I was surprised at least when I watched it in the theater the first time. And I do feel like they give the moment, the moment, the gravity that it has. This is a movie of much fewer sort of emotional scenes or, or I don't know, actually, Scratch that. I suppose they're, they're about even as, as the first one. Anyway, but yeah, that, that first one, you know, where he's, I guess, trying to breathe air into her, or to sort of kiss her goodbye, trying to get that last one in there before it turns into, you know, necrophilia. Sorry, I, I, I do that joke way too often. I, I enjoy that joke way, way too much. And then we have the end, just to, to cover the, the various emotional moments in the film, with, you know, the, the second to last scene. Originally, I think it was the last scene, where he tells the Nesky daughter that he killed her parents. And, yeah, you know, t t that thing about, you know, if, if it's someone you love, you want to know the truth. Like he himself won't be going after the truth for the entire movie because he, yeah, he, he loved Marie. And he maybe some, I don't know, maybe he felt like he owed her that, yeah. But yeah, both very effective emotional scenes, I would say. It, you know, I, I, I may in the review sound, 
like I really don't like Paul Greengrass as a director, but it's really just the the very sparsely lit scenes, especially sparsely lit action scenes. That's pretty much the only thing I really have a problem with. And then sometimes I feel like he should use just a second or two more on a shot just to let the audience actually grasp what we're looking at because these fights and such are already... I mean, th these people think so fast and they, they do things that we <laughs> normal people need just a second or at least a half second more to just completely re realize what, what we've just seen and why it makes sense. But, but yes, he clearly is good at, I, I've pretty much only watched this, you know, these two movies by him, and then, didn't he direct Green Zone also, you know, that really ill-timed, you know, several years too late, we're in Iraq for no good reason, attempt to recapture the, you know, the glory of the this trilogy, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing, I get it, but... Go searching for some other, you know, really great combination. You, you can't reenact it, you know. If, oh, but it's Matt Damon. He's still not pro-government. It's Paul Greengrass. It's an action movie. It's got to be like Bourne. No. Anyway. The... Yeah, he, he clearly knows how to evoke emotion. And it doesn't feel forced. It doesn't feel at all kind of it it just it's genuine. I mean that that last scene that's that's why test audiences didn't like it, you know, that's it's such a drab ride throughout the movie and then it ends on, by the way, I killed your parents. Merry Christmas and goodbye. And I don't blame them for you know, wanting something that was a little, yeah. And then we have another scene of Bourne, you know, looking through a rifle scope at Pamela Landy. Now, the... The... I, I like the scene where the final Treadstone agent, or sort of the last two Treadstone agents, face off against each other. You know, we have... Is it supposed to be the guy from the ending of the first one? I, I'm never quite sure, because they look somewhat similar, and I'm pretty sure that guy was Treadstone. Anyway. And, uh, yeah, they have a really great fight, and, you know, you have that moment where he, he knows before he even opens the door. He just, he knows that Jason is in there. And we know that he knows. And then he goes in, he punches in the, the Kiko, which we then, after, excuse me, afterwards find out that that was how he alerted the backup. And then he goes to the, the refrigerator. You know, seems normal enough. I mean, he's just going for a drink. He's just been out, coming home from work. Yeah, gun, you know. And... Right before he turns around with the gun, Jason is standing there with his gun. You know, I guess the he got over that whole lib anti-gun thing from the first movie. I mean, it's almost like this. these movies were done by different people or something. I don't know. I, I don't actually know if it's Doug Lyman's input to, to... Anyway. Yeah, the... You know, and, and then he's like, I, I already took out the clip. Because Jason knew he was going to do that. He left the gun so that he wouldn't, you know, I don't know, grab a bottle and throw it at him or something. So he would go for the gun still, and then he's like, felt a little light. So, yeah. And then they have the conversation, and that really nice fight. And Jason just grabs, I think, what's this, like a magazine or something, and rolls it up real tight, and then he uses that to fight with, you know, like the pen in the first one. Pretty good, yeah, it, it, great concept with this fighting with everyday objects kind of thing. One thing I do feel like, I, it seems like the first three people he meets, 
that Jason meets in this movie. He asks the exact same questions. You know, who's running Treadstone? You know, what what is why why are they after me? This kind of stuff. I don't know, it just he does he keep not believing? He keeps getting the same answer. Does he just continue thinking that it's that that they're lying to him? Or yeah, the, the first guy even says, why would I lie? And so, yeah, I, I don't know, it just... He, he feels a little bit... It, it, I don't know, it, it maybe feels a little unnecessary that he keeps just going over the same... I don't know, maybe it's just me. The... One thing I really didn't particularly care for in this, that the first one really nicely avoided is this thing of this one has the spy action thriller cliché of there's someone corrupt in the agency and that just takes it a bit out of the grey area and right into black and white and that's just really annoying you know, you have a ward is suddenly corrupt, and the and Kirill, the Secret Service agent, also corrupt, presumably because the guy he's fighting for, the guy who's he he's sort of the you know the hired gun of the guy, the oil guy, Russian oil guy, and yeah. It's it's just less interesting. I also really wonder why they chose Kirill instead of the last Treadstone agent. Why didn't they send Treadstone after Treadstone like they did in the first one? It it just doesn't really. If I mean, if they had him, what was he completely retired? Or I mean, I get that Treadstone was decommissioned, but if Ward was the one who called for this kind of thing, oh, sorry, just figured it out, paper trail kind of thing, they, if Treadstone went after Treadstone, they'd figure out it was, yeah, okay, so they went with a Russian Secret Service guy, yeah, never mind. Now, the, and, and, you know, the, the thing with getting the, what's it called? Confession on tape is also pretty cliche for the genre. One of the in, in the review I mentioned that it's at times it seems like Bourne is psychic. There's that one time where he boards a subway train, I think it is, and then he basically you know the, the door is closing too slowly. And so he, yeah, he knows if he stays, he'll be caught. So he runs, and he, like, he runs across a bridge. This is where the, the darkness, the close-up shots, the shaky cam, and the fast pace really made it confusing. But yeah, I think he, like, runs across a bridge, jumps onto a boat, and gets back, and suddenly he gets back to the train, and then he gets in, and then the doors close. I get the sort of the humor of the, oh, you know, the train doors never close, you know, when you want them to, and they take a while to close. How did he know exactly how long they, they would take to close? How could he be sure that he would get back in time? How, would he, how did he know exactly when that boat would be under that bridge? All of these just... Yeah, you just, you can't completely believe it. It's like the Joker in the Dark Knight. It's just, okay, that was really lucky, dude. How, how could you be sure that would work? And then there are, it feels like there are at least like two chases in this. At least one. When he's getting chased out of the hotel, you know, and he's in like the room opposite of the one they thought he'd be staying in. I didn't quite pick up how he got the key, but I guess, you know, like, maybe he, he spends a second looking at the cleaning lady, so maybe he stole it from the cleaning personnel. Maybe he played that hotel level in the first Hitman game. I can live with that. So he's in the, the 
the other room than they expected. And again, he's sitting there getting a flashback, and apparently he figured how long that would take. So he, I, I don't know, did he go there for to get a flashback? I guess he's leading Pamela there. Did he even fully remember by then that that was where it happened? Anyway, so he climbs out of the place, and yeah, it just feels like this entire scene was really just... It was there so they could have that kind of scene, where again, in the first movie, I don't really feel like there's any confrontation that is just there, so we could have a confrontation there. You know, it's, it's kind of what happens when you ramp up the pace. You, you know, you, you have to come up with excuses for scenes like this. And yeah, sometimes those excuses are really obvious to the audience. Now, the... I do maybe also feel like Kirill could have done a better job of checking. I get why he accidentally shot Marie. And I think that the movie does a good job of this because it's that, you know, Bourne... I don't know, Bourne doesn't even really know that the guy has a sniper rifle. And so he, you know, he switches positions with Marie. So, what was it? So that she's driving so that he can shoot. Yeah, something like that. No, wait, so he can get out. He wants to get out so he can go after them. And then she, you know, I, I do love how they do that. You know, she's shot just in this big moment, you know, she's saying, you know, no, you, you have a choice, you can, you can, we can stay together, you don't have to do this, you don't have to go after them. She doesn't want him to go and, you know, like, and it's very true to her character, she doesn't want him to go and to hurt people, you know, and just as she's saying that, she just exactly says it, and he's sitting there considering it, seriously considering it, for her, he... He genuinely cares about her, and then she gets shot, and then we see that Kirill had. I mean, we see him like get it out, I think, but we don't see him like sit and take aim. It's again, it's not one of these, you know. It's not bad to have a scene where we see a sniper slowly preparing to shoot a target. It's just that we've seen it so many times before, and so it wouldn't be that interesting to show us that. Instead, have someone just be shot, and then we see there was a sniper. You know, the, the one thing you could maybe say about it in this movie is that it happened in the first movie as well, but yeah. Now, the... But, but yeah, you know, so, and then the car goes into the water, and Kirill is just satisfied because Bourne doesn't come back up. I just feel like Ward might have underlined some words such as make sure he's dead, he's really good at surviving, you know, stuff like that. It's just, yeah, that's, like I mentioned to you, you have trained people making mistakes just because otherwise there wouldn't be a movie. You know, if Kirill had stayed and made properly sure, I mean, it wouldn't have taken him that long to determine that he wasn't actually dead. And so it would have been, well, it would have been a different movie, I suppose. You know, I also just, I don't know, I'm not crazy about how Kirill disappears for most of the movie. I don't know, maybe it's to keep it from being mainstream. You know, it's, again, in a lot of big action movies, it would be that Bourne would then go after Kirill and not stop until he's dead, kind of thing. Where in this, it's kind of just, he he reappears at the end because they find out. His boss finds out that Bourne is dead, and so Kirill goes after him again. Bourne wasn't even particularly going after him at all. You know, and, and he, in fact, I, something I really do like about this movie, and very much respect about it, is that the entire climax, the entire third of the movie, I guess, is just born making, I mean, he's gotten the confession, he's proven to Landy that he didn't do it. He knows that they're going to get off his back now. He just wants to make things right. It was his first mission, and 
there's this girl who doesn't know how her parents really died, and so he's determined to get there, even if it kills him. He's, I, I feel like he could live with dying, yeah, as long as he gets there in time, as long as he gets to say to her, I killed your parents, I'm sorry. I, I really appreciate that, and that's very true to his character, and that's also something that really lifts him above sort of the usual, I mean, for one thing, it makes him flawed. He's not, you know, I, everyone I've killed deserved to die, and it was all right. I'm sorry I killed this person. I'm sorry I killed these two people. And for another, it's, yeah, it's a very different way to end an action movie. Very, very downer ending, and yeah, and, and it also just sort of makes sense as a sort of, again, realistic approach. He feels bad about it, and he wants to apologize for one thing, and he wants her to know the truth. It is going to be a bit of an extended trip if he's going to go around telling every family member of someone he's killed over his years of Treadstone, but I digress. That might more or less cover it. Making Abbott the basically bad guy in this. Man, I hate saying that about one of these movies. There really shouldn't be a bad guy. It's more interesting if it's just, well, yeah, this, this is what the CIA does, and some of it's really not very pleasant. Is c'est la vie. Anyway, making him the bad guy feels a bit obvious. I don't know, it... Yeah, I, I suppose I can't really put my finger on why. I just, I especially would say you, you knew at least a bit before you see it. You know, I, I don't know, maybe it was sort of hints so that when you rewatch it, you could say, ah, oh, he was, you know, he's talking about killing Bourne all along, and Maybe they signaled it too much, maybe they made those hints too strong. Because Pamela directly says it at one point, you know, I don't know, maybe halfway through the move, four minutes in or something. You know what happened? You keep saying we should kill Bourne. It, yeah. And then, you know, basically, other than Nikki, by the end of this movie, Pretty much everyone who was involved with Treadstone is dead. You know, Ward kills himself, and before that he kills Zorn. So, pretty much everyone we saw in the first movie, and all connected to Treadstone, is dead by the end of this movie. I... I don't know, I... And, and the thing with, you know, ah, oh, he did it for money, and... This kind of, yeah, it's just, it's so obvious and so bland. It's, it's so cliche, you know. That might more or less cover it. Yes. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.